Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the World Bank, a very warm welcome to all of you to the side event on linking air quality management to climate change mitigation, which is taking place today and tomorrow. We have a packed agenda for you on both of these days. The first session will discuss the magnitude of the global air pollution challenge and how it links to climate change, an issue that is much neglected. You will hear from our speakers today that air pollution is estimated to cause about 7 million deaths a year. And from this flows a cascade of misery and misfortune. The death rate is four times higher in low and middle and low middle income countries than it is in higher income countries. Children and the elderly, of course, are more vulnerable to the impacts of air pollution. And the World Bank has estimated that the health costs of exposure to air pollution is about $8.1 trillion, or roughly about 6% of global GDP. That's a very, very large number and competes with the damages we estimate from climate change. What causes the damage? Many of you will know. It's fine aerosol particles, also known as PM2.5 and ozone, which are, the, which are the deadly pollutants. There are close linkages between air pollution, the incidence of illness, and the probability of death, especially from COVID-19. We also know from plenty of empirical studies that exposure to PM2.5, that is air pollution, impacts the learning ability of students, their examination performance, and indeed also worker productivity. There are very, very real health and economic impacts. Turning next to the climate pollutants, as of course all of you will know, it is carbon dioxide, methane, and black carbon that are the most important ones. But contrary to popular perception, these have no discernible health effects. However, very often it is the sources of these harmful air pollutants and greenhouse gases that are often the very same. Recent work by the World Bank in partnership with Purdue University has found that there is an almost 80% correlation between the sources of PM2.5 and the greenhouse gas emission multipliers. But despite these linkages, interventions to tackle climate change are usually handled very, very separately from those that tackle air pollution. And indeed, it is not surprising that we would make a much more compelling case for countries to act and act now if we can show that there are immediate benefits rather than benefits that accrue in the distant future and are uncertain. Today, as many of you will know, we are broadcasting from the methane pavilion in Glasgow. And methane is a short-lived climate pollutant produced during the decomposition of organic waste. It is also one of the precursors of ozone, which causes about a million deaths a year. Reducing methane through things like improved waste management reduces ozone and protects human health. More generally, it has been estimated that global temperature rise can be reduced by approximately 0.5 degrees Celsius by 2050 if we implement existing and very cost-effective interventions to reduce short-lived climate pollutants such as methane, black carbon, and ozone. In a few moments, you will hear more about all of this from Drew Schindel. His presentation will show us that when the health costs of air pollution are included, the short-term benefits of climate mitigation becomes very cost-effective and very much worth doing here and now. And this is the case even in countries where air pollution is rather mild. And this is exactly why for over 20 years, the World Bank has invested very heavily in the air pollution agenda. Indeed, the World Bank has est is estimated to have invested about 16 billion US dollars to tackle air pollution. But the problem is urgent and the investment is insufficient, as we all know. Before I hand the floor over, let me give you a sense of some of the issues that will be discussed in the next two days that are very, very important. The first issue that, that, that will be discussed is how one can better integrate interventions to control air pollution 
and reduce greenhouse gases. Related to that, of course, is the issue of how investments in air pollution can be scaled up. Now, let me yield the floor to Sarah Vogel, who will chair the first session. Sarah is the Senior Vice President for Health at the Environmental Defense Fund. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for a wonderful overview. And thank you for all of you joining us from, uh, looks like all across the world. Um, I'm Sarah Vogel. I'm gonna chair our first session. Um, uh, we're really excited about this um, COP26 side event on catalyzing action to address these twin crises of climate change and air pollution. And I wanna thank everyone for taking time today and we hope joining us tomorrow as well. And I wanna express appreciation for our partners who come together um, to plan and execute this event, the World Bank, the OECD, World Resources Institute, and the Clean Air Catalyst, which is an initiative of USAID. Before we um, get into our amazing panelists, um, I just wanna ground us here on, on, on why we're having this uh, discussion today, which is breathing, right? Breathing is vital, it's life. But for the vast majority of people on this planet right now, the air that they breathe is not giving life, but cutting it short. We are confronted today with two interlocking global crises, a public health crisis of air pollution, with, as we heard, an estimated 7 million people dying prematurely, and of course, the existential crisis of climate change. And we need to confront this twin challenge now with both a climate and clean air lens, targeting those pollutants that Richard previewed that warm both the air and harm our health. And I, this past 10 days, we've heard a number of speeches, incredible emotional appeals from the youth for ambitious collective action. We're hearing commitments to cut emissions that threaten the vitality of this planet, now is clearly the time for action. And so these sessions today and tomorrow are really focused on how can we better direct our collective attention and most critically the resources towards putting the actions that we know, we know can deliver both cleaner air and climate change and putting the health and well-being of people, especially those most vulnerable to air pollution and climate change, the poor, the marginalized communities, young children, pregnant women at the center of these efforts. So I wanna just thank um, an incredible distinguished group of experts we have today who um, are gonna share their knowledge, their expertise in this opening session. They are all leaders in the field who are raising the urgency and setting really a pathway for the world to meet both of these crises. So please join me in welcoming um, our opening speakers. We have Maria Nira, Director of the Department of Public Health and Environment at the World Health Organization. Dr. Gru Shindel, Professor of Earth Science at Duke University and World Bank Consultant. Emmanuel Apo, Acting Director of Environmental Quality Standards at the Environmental Protection Agency in Ghana. And Yawande Awe, Senior Environmental Engineer at the World Bank and Program Manager for the Pollution Management and Environmental Health Multi-Donor Trust Fund. We're gonna divide the session into two blocks, each with two short presentations, followed by some um, question and answer. Um, and we've asked Maria Nira, who's um, been leading this effort um, to raise global awareness uh, on air pollution crisis, um, to open the session to discuss the new WHO air quality guidelines. So Dr. Nira, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be with you. I'm connected uh, from Glasgow at the COP where, as you well know, we are trying to incorporate this health argument into uh, all the clim climate action decisions. Yesterday was a very intense, strong and uh, powerful day for, for all of us because we were having the opportunity to uh, present how the health sector can contribute to, uh, to reducing our own emissions and giving a kind of example. So yesterday, a very important uh, initiative under the COP26 presidency was launched. And we have now 52 countries committed to reduce, uh, to, to go for low carbon health system in their own countries. 
and uh, at the same time as well, uh, creating climate resilience healthcare facilities. This is already a kind of message saying, okay, the health sector can contribute. We can prove that we can lead by example. If we put together collectively the emissions generated by the health sector, those represent 5% of uh, these uh, total emissions. And therefore our effort to reduce that will be uh, contributing to the agenda and stimulating and motivating. Now, this is, uh, as I say, an initiative to prove that uh, action is possible. Uh, we want to demonstrate that the health sector uh, is, is, is motivating more of this type of actions. The second one is, as you rightly say, the fact that uh, there is a critical need to understand the very, very strong and non-negotiable, not uh, controversial, extremely clear, scientifically based, arguments that uh, climate change causes and uh, uh, air pollution causes overlap in a, in a big uh, uh, proportion. And therefore, for us, the reduction of emissions will be translated in an important reduction of, uh, of the air pollution and therefore on an important reduction of those 7 million premature deaths caused by every year by exposure to that. So the new air quality guidelines, as you probably know by now, I'm sure you know that very well by now, they are, um, they are looking at six key pollutants. And for five of them, what we are proposing is to reduce on a very important way the recommended levels of exposure because there is no safe level of exposure essentially. And when you look at the PM 2.5, which is the most uh, dangerous, the most harmful for our health, uh, the reduction is very substantial. And now the question is how the countries will be uh, able to do that? Well, here we are, the solutions are very much uh, well known and what the, the CCAC, uh, CCA uh, Climate and Clean Air Coalition has been doing, for instance, is very important. The, the, the short-lived climate pollutants can provide a very good response to, to that, how the the cities, how the governments will be moving into reducing the air pollution, which represent one of the biggest, if not the biggest, public health problem we are confronting now. So those uh, air quality guidelines, um, the comments is that, well, they are very ambitious, um, it will be very difficult, but this is the only way to protect our health. I mean, if we, we are serious about uh, protecting our health, those are the only levels that are assembled. And implementing those levels will be very much about agreeing here at Glasgow on, on, on a substantial reduction of emissions. The agreement on methane and the, 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 what they are proposing on coal and black carbon, I think it should be uh, done uh, in the name of health. Uh, I think it's, it's, it, the health argument can be the one on a very strong way uh, that can motivate that finally uh, action is taken at the level of ambition and the speed that we need on all of that. Um, we are in addition to the, the, the guidelines and the levels for those six uh, key pollutants, uh, we have as well some uh, uh, interim targets and some good practices uh, that uh, we are recommending to the countries to put in place. We are organizing webinars and to, to, to explain how those guidelines were done, what we are intending to do, what the health benefits to, could be. And we are welcoming your support and, 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 and a strong uh, contribution to how we will be implementing all of that now. Um, obviously the, 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 the economic argument that was presented before is something that we is very important for us as well. It's, 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 uh, so frustrating to see that there are still um, subsidies going to the fossil fuels, uh, uh, ignoring uh, or not including in the considerations the fact that then there will be a horrible cost for the health system to treat the patients that uh, because of the exposure to the combustion of those fossil fuels we are generating. And that those externalities have never included in the economic considerations or very little. So when, when they say that those interventions are expensive, uh, well, where is your calculation? How did you calculate that? Uh, you probably never incorporate 
the fact that our hospitals are treating chronic diseases that require a long-term assistance and an expenditure, in addition, obviously, to the, the, what represents for the life of the people. And that post has never been included on the equation. So all positive, enormous health benefits that can be obtained if we tackle the causes of climate change and air pollution. Short-lived climate pollutants can be a fantastic low hanging fruit that we can put in place. And the and WHO is, is, is extremely committed to move this as one of the biggest uh, public health agendas and recognizing that uh, what is discussed here at the COP is certainly not just an environmental treaty. What is discussed here at the COP is, is a public health treaty. And uh, if the decisions are right, our health will be protected. If the decisions are wrong, our health will be very much at risk. What we are confronting now is a massive health crisis or public health crisis of international dimension. I will stop here, Sarah. I hope I was not too long. Happy to, to, to keep this conversation, not for too long because I'm afraid I need to go back and travel back. But um, thanks for the opportunity and back to you, thank you. Thank you, Maria. And I, maybe I will ask you, um, you, how much time do you have? Because we did want to follow up on questions, but um, we were going to go to Drew for about 10 minutes. Do you, how long do you have? I can go for another, yes, 10 minutes max, yes. 10 minutes max. Okay, well, you know, what I'm going to do is actually going to go to you and ask a question so that we maximize the time that you have with us. Um, so, you know, you, you know, you talked about these new ambitious um, guidelines. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, what you see WHO doing to work with um, countries to um, begin to try to implement these guidelines into their existing policies and standards. Um, get into a little bit more detail about what you see as sort of the role of WHO in, in that capacity. Okay. Um, many, many things. Uh, uh, we have put together a, a large uh, technical advisory group. I think this is important to have a very, uh, the group has uh, initiated the work uh, just a few weeks ago, and I'm sure that some of the participants today uh, are members of that uh, advisory group. And I, that group will be looking at research question and uh, particularly operational research in terms of which interventions are the most adequate one and how to respond to the implementation of the new uh, guidelines. Another thing that uh, is quite important is that uh, we are now working on uh, training packages for the health professionals. I think uh, you know, pediatricians, uh, respiratory specialized doctors, all the, the, the health sector needs to be very much empowered to talk about this. Not that they don't see the connection, not that they don't understand, but probably they don't know enough how to uh, play their influence, how to make sure that their voices are heard and uh, what can they do. And uh, the fact that you cannot uh, use only your treatment, your curative knowledge and capacities, you need to get out of your hospital and, and, and influence and raise your voice, which is a very credible one. And, and, and we want doctors now talking about uh, renewable sources of energy that sometimes they don't feel very comfortable. So we need to, to make sure that that training will pro provide that. The other view, uh, the other big pillar will be legislation. I think we cannot ignore the power of legislation at country level. Uh, our, as you well know, our uh, guidelines are not legally binding. They are just some recommendations. Why not to, to, to promote, you know, a more, uh, I mean, a national legislation? The fact that they are not legally binding doesn't mean that the countries cannot go for something legally binding and, and ambitious. So, I think we need to explore a little bit more those possibilities of uh, and using resolutions and using the World Health Assembly where the ministers are there to, to work on those, on this political part. Then, of course, identifying all of those interventions at the urban level. I think at the urban level, uh, the work with mayors, uh, I'm sure you all saw what the mayor of London is trying to do, what the mayor of uh, Paris is trying to do, Barcelona, there is, Utrecht yesterday was telling us uh, at our events uh, how are they moving on that. So more we gain the, the, the local 
policy makers, I mean, the mayors on, on this, uh, uh, and we did with uh, Climate and Clean Air Coalition, what we call it the Urban Health Initiative, which is providing very good results in Ghana and Nepal, and we can extrapolate now that on this intersectorial work and, and all of that. And then we have a, 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 an alliance uh, between energy and health, where again, we put together ministers of energy and ministers of health. We are mobilizing the health community to reduce our own emissions. And, and, and that will be fantastic. You know, imagine from the packaging of the, the pharmaceuticals, uh, the, the waste of the healthcare facilities, uh, access to, to clean sources of energy at the hospitals. This is a fantastic challenge. challenge. And of course, we keep uh, providing scientific evidence, mobilizing, do advocacy. At country level, I think uh, then the, the implementation has to come on, on mobilizing the, the role of the, the health sector and proposing interventions uh, uh, on, on the reduction, uh, reduction of air pollution, assessment first of what are the sources. There are so many things to do, Sarah. I, I could keep talking for, for ages, but we need partners for sure. We need many, 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 we all need uh, uh, many partners to implement because this is a huge, huge, huge task. Well, thank you and a, a tremendous amount of uh activities that um, WHO is leading, uh, particularly with the health sector, and we will capture all of those in the recording. And um, thank you for joining us in the midst of many, many activities in Glasgow and, um, and have a wonderful rest of your time and keep, keep, uh, keep up the effort. <laughs> We're hearing your voice all over the world. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. And lovely to see Drew and others connected. So you will have better answers to all of those questions that, that you are in a very good hands. The Breathe Life campaign, I need to mention that if not, they are going to kill me. It's a fantastic uh, uh, initiative as well. And uh, I think it will give enormous uh, results and, and, and impactful, uh, impactful activities. Probably. Yes, great. Thank you so much. Um, so Thank we're going to dive right in with um, Dr. Drew Shandell um, to really talk about um, short-lived climate pollutants. Um, Drew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining from, indeed, it seems like all over the world. I am happy to be joining you today from Scotland. And I wanted to talk uh, kind of broadly about some of the science and really the links across the different pollutants, including short-lived climate pollutants. Uh, I wanted to thank the World Bank for who I've been working with as a consultant for inviting me and Maria already mentioned the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Um, so really the, the key message I wanted to get across here is that reducing emissions of all of the things that drive climate change tends to be good for human as well as planetary health. And the reasons vary across the pollutants. Reducing carbon dioxide is not directly affect public health at all, but carbon dioxide tends to be co-emitted with things like particulate matter. Reducing nitrogen, nitrous oxide, well, one of the best ways to do that is to stop over-fertilizing crops. And over-fertilization leads to water pollution, et cetera, but it also leads to excess release of ammonia, which is another component of particulate, the fine particulate matter we just heard about in the World Health Organization guidelines. And then we have some of the, the very specific short-lived climate pollutants. We have methane, carbon monoxide, volatile organics, and black carbon, all of which actually do directly affect public health. Black carbon is a component of PM 2.5, and the other three are precursors of tropospheric ozone. And so I, I guess you could argue maybe that's not quite as direct, uh, but these pollutants via atmospheric chemistry affect ozone, which affects public health. So really reductions, almost any of the strategies we can take to deal with climate change will have beneficial effects for public health. And, and I think that's really a very important message to get across. Obviously I, I am American and I come from a US perspective. And one of the things we've seen in the US is the difficulty of persuading people to really take action that as we heard, tends, tends to be viewed as giving benefits far away in space and far in the future in, in time. 
Uh, well, they have to pay costs now, right? You have to change your lifestyle now, invest in new kinds of energy, and the benefits come later. So we had a paper that just came out last week, in fact, and here is one of the key results here, where we looked at the United States and looked at the benefit cost ratio for the U.S. portion of a worldwide transition to a two degree, under two degree scenario versus a reference case. And what you can see down there in these red lines toward the bottom is that in you know the mantra we've heard for a long time it's 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 expensive to do something but it's even more expensive not to do something right so the the red line is the benefits from avoided climate change and those do pass the mitigation cost in the latter half of the century like it's overwhelmingly and then and then alarmingly so right they get much higher um, what this is saying is that indeed it it even more expensive not to act because of all of the climate damages. But it's saying that those take a long time. It, then you move up to that blue line and you can see acting this decade will give you in the order of 10, 15 times the benefits that it cost you to decarbonize the economy. So these are the kind of things that Maria and I was just talking about, fewer people going to the hospital, fewer people dying, fewer labor losses, all of these kind of things mean that the health benefits can be a really powerful motivating factor. The other thing is that the majority of these health benefits and come from air quality come from those places that take action. So what we, we also did in our study was look at, the, as I said, this is the entire world transforming, but we also looked at what if the US alone transforms, and then you get hardly any climate benefits because that's indeed a global problem, requires global cooperation. But if the US decarbonizes, we still get the vast majority of quality benefits. So the, the argument that, well, we have to wait till everybody's acting and well the benefits will come later all of those things really go away when you include air quality along with climate change one of the other things i wanted to highlight what was the role of the short-lived climate pollutants and how they're so complementary to decarbonization efforts and again as this red line at the bottom is saying oh the climate benefits are, are profound but they take a long time to appear the reason is because when you phase out fossil fuels this is a, a graph from a study of, from a couple of years ago. You're also reducing some of the cooling agents, the sulfur aerosols that come out primarily from coal burning. And so in a, in a very short term, you might get actually a very, very tiny, you know, almost insignificant penalty, uh, nothing really to worry about. But the point is that even here, but out by 2050, our best estimate of what you get from phasing out fossil fuels is nothing for climate. So it's a huge benefit as for public health, but not really for climate. Obviously, it's an enormous thing by 2100, right? This is key for solving the long-term climate crisis. But this is not going to alleviate the suffering that we're already seeing, you know, in headlines around the world, wildfires, people losing their home, heat waves killing people, hurricanes damaging coastlines and infrastructure, and, and, and again, killing people. One of the ways that we can, however, bend the curve of warming in the near term is methane because methane is a short-lived pollutant. So what we've been really highlighting, in, especially in the run-up to this COP, is the role of methane as a complementary short-lived climate pollutant that really plays a, a, a companion to our decarbonization efforts. It's not an either or, it's both of these are because we want to reduce climate damages in the near term and we want to reduce them in the long term. They're, both of those are very key. What we've looked at, and I think we, we even heard some of this before, for those who weren't so familiar with methane, it's a much more powerful but much more short-lived greenhouse gas than CO2. And as, as I think we heard, it causes about half of the around a million, a little over a million deaths per year due to tropospheric ozone, right, by catalyzing the chemical formation of that ozone at the boundary layer at the surface. We released with the CCAC and the UN Environment Program a, an assessment called the Global Methane Assessment, Benefits and Costs of Mitigating Methane back in May. And to put us on a 1.5 degree path, we found that we needed to reduce our emissions by around 45% by the end of this decade which at the time seemed almost unimaginable, 
<laughs> such a large and, and in particular, such a very fast reduction. But we, what we documented in the assessment was that, of course, being a strong greenhouse gas, it gives you this avoided warming. It gives you avoided warming very quickly. And that's what I was showing this, why it makes it such a nice complement to CO2. But it's not only a greenhouse gas because of all of the ozone. So it would save a quarter million deaths per year from respi respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. Ozone is, plants don't like it any more than people do. And we breathe it in. It's not good for us. Crops take ozone in and it stunts their growth. And so millions of tons of, of staple cross, billions of hours of lost work due to the heat exposure. There's even more due to air pollution exposure, presumably. Uh, we didn't have a chance to look at that one. All the hospital visits that we were just hearing from Maria Nier. And, and what we found furthermore that there are very clear ways to do this. Methane comes from a multitude of sectors. This isn't simply an energy story or even energy and transportation. It is fo fossil fuels are a big sector, but waste and agriculture are also big sources of methane. So we looked at how this might be done and based on feasibility and cost, the, the fastest place to make big, big inroads is the fossil fuel sector. But to meet the 1.5 degree targets, we really need to target all three sectors. The good news about methane is that, sorry there, is that um, I, I also wanted to point out there that decarbonization alone does reduce methane, but much, much more slowly and only really gets rid of the, the fossil fuel component. So it's not sufficient to just look at CO2. Let me go back to, there we go. The good news is that methane mitigation, because especially from fossil fuel sectors, what you're doing is, is leaking less methane from natural gas systems, as well as capturing and using methane from things like oil exploration or landfills or manure and in agricultural settings. And that methane is valuable, right? Obviously it's valuable in a natural gas system. That's the whole reason you have the system, but it's also valuable to make energy from these other systems. And so many of the measures pay for themselves. Many of the others are low cost. And so we're, we can diverge from an increasing trajectory that we're on now and get down to one with very large co um, cuts in methane by 2030 all at very, very low or even negative costs. And then there's a few that are more expensive, right? So there, there is a need for some financing. There's a need for regulations to push these forward. Um, but the, the story for methane is one that's, that's somewhat more tractable than some of the most difficult things that we need to do to combat climate change. I should also note that all of these are only the costs based on those putting in place the measures, right? This is not including the environmental impacts. And if you include the environmental impacts, that adds around another 40, over $4,000 per ton, largely from these human health impacts. And those stem largely from ozone. So they're very, they're very rapid. They occur uh, quickly. They're not so dependent on your discount rate assumptions because they're in the near term and they make almost every methane measure a net winner from a financial point of view. Just to elaborate a tiny bit more on methane, one of the other things that I think has been really compelling is that it is not purely a developed and advanced country problem. And methane comes from, especially because it comes from the waste sector and the agricultural sector, you can see that all around the world, there are substantial methane emissions. And what really varies is not whether you have them in a particular region, but which is the dominant sector, right? In the Middle East, it's going to be fossil fuels, but in China, it's, you know, it's uh, agriculture. And in Africa, perhaps landfills and agriculture put together. So everywhere, every part, Part of the world has something can and needs to be part of the methane story. We are not going through the any details, so don't try to read them. My point here is out the fact that in fact we know exactly what to do. It's all being done. It's being done somewhere, and we just need to take the best practices, for example, within the oil and gas sector, and bring those to countries which aren't putting into place those best practices. An example is the United States, where we have far higher methane release per unit of oil and gas produced than many other parts of the world. And last week, the EPA announced regulations 
to finally start managing more of those. But the waste sector too, we know what to do. We do it in many parts of the world. And in the developing world in particular, solid waste management it can could be greatly improved by following practices of the advanced countries. Same kind of thing for agriculture. And again, I'm not gonna go through these. It's harder to get a really deep reduction in agriculture with with just kind of technical controls, but there are things we can do to improve herd health and improve the yield from rice and that, that can really help. And then there are other things that are beyond simple technical controls, but more behavioral like dietary change for the agricultural sector, like reduced food loss, which prevents organics from ever even getting into the waste sector. And of course, transitioning away from uh, fossil to renewables is going to have a role in the fossil sector. The main point though here is that this is not simply a story of energy and transport. The short-lived climate pollutants are much less dominated by those two sectors than is CO2. I wanted to just extremely briefly touch on a couple of the other short-lived climate pollutants since we heard a little bit, bit about them. HFCs are another one that can get us a, a relative, relatively easily get us a dent in climate change in the near term because many of them are fairly short-lived. And black carbon is another that's particularly important primarily because it has an outsized health impact. And one of the, the things that it is a major black carbon source is biofuel cooking in particular in, in developing countries. And it's, it's just ab abhorrent what this does to primarily women and children who are indoors around these cooking fires, breathing an incredible amount of particulate. And so this is part of improving energy access, doing that in a carbon friendly way, but at the same time getting climate benefits from reduced black carbon and enormous health benefits as well. So the same kind of thing as for methane. We know what to do. We have done it some places, banning burning of agricultural waste and instead plowing it back under, you know, these are the kind of things that are better for the land. Altogether, this can get us another couple tenths of a degree by the middle of the century. So these are really complementary. We can just kind of sum up, we have opportunities to greatly reduce the short-lived climate pollutants quickly. We need to scale those up. And if we do that, we get these enormous benefits that we've quantified very clearly for, for many things. But there are also these kind of benefits that are related to more of what you're trying to do sometimes um, in particular activities. Like if you're trying to improve waste sector, your benefits are really the sanitation that come from that and the water quality and the health from noxious fumes nearby and climate might be more thought of as your co-benefit. So some of these things really have um, climate is the co-benefit, some of them health is co-benefit. Either way, they tend to all be good for both. I would say that my, my view on things is that overall a policies that cover a wide range of pollutants, not just CO2, but all of the things that are affecting climate change and affecting air quality, and that cover a wide range of sectors, right? not just energy and transport, but paying attention to waste and agriculture and other sources that affect climate. These can really provide benefits for human and ecosystem health, for gender equality, for productivity, for water quality, jobs, and environmental justice. So I think it's a great thing that we were seeing a lot of movement towards incorporating air quality within climate change. And in particular at this COP, we've seen more than 100 countries sign on to a global methane pledge based in large part on the kind of conclusions and the, the logic that I just outlined. So thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions if we have some time. Back to you, Sarah. Yes, thank you, Drew. That was an uh, amazing sweep of, of information that you've been, um, <laughs> your tremendous research. So thank you so much. Um, Lots of questions. Um, we have about five minutes. So um, you mentioned, you know, the that we've got over 100 countries now signing onto this commitment to reduce methane by 30 percent um, by 2030. Not quite as ambitious as you outlined. Um, you know, as countries are looking for cost-effective, low-hanging measures right out of the gate to consider abating um, some of the short-lived climate pollutants and, and other co-pollutants that you mentioned. Um, what should they, you know, where do they start? Um, what's the what's the first step? 
Yeah, so I, I, I think that that will depend a lot on the context of the country. But for any country that has a lot of fossil fuels, that is probably the very easiest place to go. And often, you know, it's an industry that has money as well. So it, it really doesn't take such an enormous push. Um, but I, I think one of the encouraging things is that we're seeing with more remote sensing that actually the emissions from oil and gas systems are larger than many of the operators thought. And they're pretty responsive to that. You know, EDF has been involved in a lot of this work and you point out to them, hey, your systems are leaking a lot. And they say, oh, we didn't know that. Maybe we should fix them. And I mean, they don't want to be deliberately losing a lot of this stuff um, in, in many cases. There are times at well completion, for example, they will release on purpose and, and we need strong regulation. So I think countries can begin with the fossil sector if they are fossil nations. Um, in places that don't have a lot of fuels, though, I, I would say the waste sector has a lot of things that can be done that are, again, extremely financially attractive and provide lots and lots of co-benefits just for the land and for people nearby and water, et cetera. And do you have um, recommendations for, for, for countries to make sure that they're capturing and maximizing the health benefits that you've really outlined at this macro level? as they're taking steps to, you know, to, to build their action plans around, around um, their, their national commitments? Well, so that's something that we have within the Climate and Clean Air Coalition have decided should be our, one of the things we try to do going forward because no, the, the global assessment really is the macro level like you just pointed out. And so that doesn't tell an individual country you know, what, what they will get and how best to optimize their policies. So the CCAC it is a companion to this new global methane pledge is launching a methane flagship. And one of the things that we'll try to do is support countries in exa exactly answering those, those particular questions. Fantastic. That's great. Um, and um, in addition to methane, um, you know, black carbon, I think there's interest in black carbon. Again, near-term low-hanging measures that countries should be considering um, as they integrate um, black carbon into their climate plans as well. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That's, uh, that's a, a, a good one. And that's, again, you know, a bit dependent on where you are. In many places, it's diesel vehicles. And often that is trucks and construction equipment and such. In some places, it's also passenger cars. Um, but that tends to be a, the biggest kind of traditional energy transport sector source. There's not much, say, from power plants and such. Um, and then the, the other thing is agricultural waste burning, where that's still ongoing. That can be like places like India. That can be a huge air quality problem, as well as you know, loss of lots of nutrients and such, um, and, a, and a substantial BC source. Uh, but in many parts of the developing world, it's this very long running problem of you know, billions of the poorest people of the world still using biofuels for cooking. And so there, I, I would say it's really an energy access issue and it's providing sustainable energy, which will, which will really get people off of biofuels and have a benefit for black carbon right away, but also contribute to reducing deforestation. So will be, will contribute to, to CO2 uh, net CO2 redu reductions as well. So I, again, it would depend on where you are. And of, of course, it, if anybody of you, any of you have been involved in, in replacing traditional cooking with modern uh, access to energy, we know that that's not an easy problem. That's not going to go away overnight, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, thank you so much. Um, this was wonderful talk. Um, we're gonna pin it now to um, our next set of speakers. And um, in doing so, shift from this kind of higher level discussion, laying the groundwork of air pollution and climate change to really talk about, you know, what's happening on the ground. Um, so our first speaker um, is uh, Mr. Emmanuel Apo. So I turn that over to you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Sarah. Please, can you share my screen? Hi, please, can you share the screen? Yeah, I'm Emmanuel Apo, 
Um, I work with the Environmental Protection Agency of Ghana, and I'm going to present on strengthening air quality management in Accra. Next step, next slide. Um, as part of the presentation at line, I'll look at the introduction, the, uh, some of the issues related to uh, air pollution, and also look at the monitoring networks and then the governance interventions that are in place, some impact and their recommendations. Next slide. Globally, about 7 million people die annually. Next slide. And um, these are normally caused by um, air pollution, exposure to uh, pollutants, and the children are normally um, affected most, especially those also with asthma and then the elderly. And over 400,000 people, uh, in terms of children under five years of age, die annually in Africa. And this is one of the highest regional charge mortality in the world. And then when you consider the air pollution related mortality in low to middle income countries, almost 90% of um, this pollution related can be found in our uh, part of the world. In the Ghanaian context, uh, we do not meet the WHO guidelines. So almost 100% of the entire population are exposed to particulate matter concentrations. And um, assessment by the WHO uh, also indicated that about 28,000 people die annually, and these are preventable deaths that can be uh, avoided. And the uh, EPA also assessed that uh, 2,800 people died in Accra, uh, metropolitan areas. Next slide. There are various sources of um, air pollution in Ghana. Um, we can have for uh, cooking in households, and then we can also look at the transport sector, the energy sector, open burning issues. Then uh, we we'll look at related issues coming from the um, natural sources like hamatan, um, sea salt, and then bush burning. Uh, globally, about um, 8.1 million is spent on uh, other quality, uh, household air pollution related illness, and this is very, very high. And a third of the global population is also known to be exposed to the um, air pollution from solid waste use, use or maybe the solid waste fuels. And we also know that economically, World Bank has also suggested that the global welfare losses in 2013 was about 1.5 trillion, which is very high. Uh, the same World Bank has also uh, assess the Ghana, Ghana's, uh, how do you call it, cost implications from air pollution. And about 2.5 billion of this economic cost can also be attributed to exposure to air pollution. And um, out of this, this is approximately about 4.2% of the GDP. A small country like Ghana, and you're spending about 4.2% of this as a, uh, in the GDP is uh, really, really, very high. And um, we also know that uh, cooking, heating accounts for about 55% of household air pollution in the country. And charcoal use is also 5%. Next. From the aspect of um, solid waste use management, um, Ghana generates a lot of solid waste, but about only 55% is collected and managed at landfills. 45% are either bent or dumped in, in, in drains on land and then bent at the backyard. And then um, most of this uh, open burning of waste, uh, when you quantify the intensity of the air pollution effects in Ghana, it's about 15%. Um, if you look at the graph, the picture there, you could see that there are a lot of climate implications from burning of such waste. You have the black carbon NOx, methane, and carbon monoxide. A carbon dioxide, these situations are very, very high. We normally cause the shortly climate uh, effects and then climate in general. Next. So from the transport sector, we could see that um, um, black carbon and then NOx are, are, are key 
in, in the country. The missions of this are key. And we all know the global implications of black carbon um, to um, the climate. And um, most of these black carbon are coming from incompatible uh, incomplete combustion of uh, fuel in vehicles and also coming from burning of used ties, burning of um, vegetation, among others, uh, are, are really very, very troublesome. And it has been known that this one also accounts for about 25% in Ghana, and the roadside is the corporate nest. So looking at the bigger picture, what do we know? We know that we need to track, we need to set monitors, we need to uh, generate data, model, and forecast, and also come with policies and then to ensure better F, uh, air quality nests. So we have a lot of network that have been set up, about 18 of them. We started from five. Next slide. We started from five. Now we have about 18 that uh, is, is deployed in the country. So you can see some of the pictures on it. We started with the six day monitoring regime. Now we have continuous monitors that to complement what we have. Then next slide. So we could see that um, the monitoring aspects, when we set up the network, the monitoring aspects from years, from the year 2007 up to 2020, a lot of interventions that have been taking place. And we could see some gradual reduction uh, in the particulate matter concentrations, but we are still not yet there. Uh, we are still at the interventions that also resulted in removing the Agbogroshi people also from there uh, has also culminated in the black carbon levels also coming down since July of this year. Next slide. Next two slides. So you can see the particulate matter reduction. Next slide. And the black carbon too has also reduced from July up to this day because of those interventions that were have, have taken place. Let's next slide. There are a lot of pathways. Next slide. There are a lot of pathways and existing strategies, interventions that have taken place in the country. And the first one is the expansion of the air quality monitoring net network. Uh, we started with five with the help of US EPA. And now we have 18 of them deployed across uh, the country uh, and the, the Greater Accra metropolitan area. And we have a host of also um, local sensors that are also deployed for some research. So to reduce the air pollution, what the country did was that we decided to look at the transport sector and look at the low emission strategies that we have to deploy. And one of them was the cleaner bus standards, uh, as they call it, uh, uh, re uh, re policies that we came with. Um, and then we also came out with some policy on electric mobility. Very soon, we'll be caught up with um, electric vehicles. So we needed to look at the infrastructure readiness of the country. So there are strategies that have been given to the government of Ghana now, which is under consideration. Then we have the US EPA also mega city program, which really built the capacity of Ghanaian scientists uh, in air quality. I must have admit that it really helped us, and this is the foundation of all the, the skills that we develop from um, air quality monitoring as a country. And then we also roll up air quality management plan and communication plan to drive the process of air quality management. And the advanced health initiative uh, programs who are also uh, deployed uh, in the country to be able to look at the short-lived climate pollutants as well as the air pollutant reduction strategies. Uh, and then we also promoted, and you keep on promoting cleaner fuel stoves in the country and promoting LPG and C CNG usage in the country. And here we have a gas national plan, Ga Ghana national gas plan, which is supposed to generate a quantum of gas to be able to drive um, electric um, electricity production from um, uh, energy burning systems and then also for domestic. And we'll be able to also reduce sulfur levels in fuel, harmonize motor vehicle fuel specifications in the West Africa sub-region. And then currently also undertaking uh, the Pollution Management Environment Health Project, which has already brought us about state of the art monitored, uh, monitors in the country, and it's really helping us a lot. And we're going to very soon broadcast 
information uh, to the public about the health implications. And then the media capacity building is also going. And in terms of climate change, we have also published the fourth national climate uh, communication plan for greenhouse gas emissions. And this plan is really very helpful for meeting at the UN uh, FCC pro, uh, 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 program. Next. So I have recommendations that I want to share with some African countries, uh, our colleagues in the African countries. What I want to say is that air pollution is very expensive, monitoring is very expensive, but we can start in a limited scale using simplified equipment and then um, deploy them to also get some uh, information to build and build on in the future. We can have those that we have been using, which is a gravimetric method, uh, some place we monitor every six days. So by the year, you should get about 62 data sets. We can also be used in determining some trend analysis. So we also look at the policies and governance structure. Ghana coordinates a lot with stakeholders. And we have a lot of policies that are in place, which is really working very well. And then we all have to, have to build capacity with the media, academia, the political folk across the spectrum and develop communication plan for air quality management. And also make sure that um, source categories for best practices are also looked at. You look at the uh, point source, you look at the mobile source, you look at the area source, and then enhance data collection capacity to evaluate the progress of emission actions. And at the end of it all, we also have information to also create awareness to the public. So these are some recommendations that um, I think when we, 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 we take and then implement them, it will help us a lot from, um, for progressing um, exactly much of our energy on air quality management in our respective countries. Yes, thank you very much. And um, I hope you all join hands for a better air, a cleaner air, and also be able to maintain uh, sanity in, in our environment in terms of air quality reduction and climate also reduction processes that we have um, endowed ourselves in. Next slide. So we would, these are some good practices I picked from the WHO new air quality guidelines. And in some areas where we they have a lot of dedications and among others, I think this program can be very, very helpful. And we need to be able to look at the dust and then look at how we're able to forecast uh, these dust storms that are coming into our respective countries. We need to maintain their quality monitoring programs and reporting procedures conduct epidemiological studies and research, and then implement wind erosion control through expansion of green spaces. This is very, very important. Um, agroforestry is very, very important here. We need to plant trees to serve as sink for most of this uh, um, CO2 emissions and also the particulate matter. And then clean our streets very, very well so that uh, we don't have airborne dust, um, wind and train dust, carrying air uh, bond dust into the atmosphere, which are very, very good. So, systematic measurements are very important. We need to take emission inventories and full economy standards. When we're able to do this, I think it go a long way to be able to look at the, the sources where these pollutions are coming from and be able to come with some policies to address them and take measures to reduce emissions where appropriately. Next. As I end here, I want to ask that we should ensure clean air, better air for all of us, our well being, and then join hands to save our planet from air emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, we're just going to pivot and I'm going to ask you um, just a, a follow up question, um, maybe just one, because we're um, coming up on time. and. Um, that is, you, you've outlined a tremendous amount of work that you've, you've done in Ghana um, and, and, some, and some really specific recommendations for other um, African countries. I wonder if you could just speak to what you see are um, 
the real resource needs um, that you face. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about that in our next session. Um, you've done a lot, you know, when you've, you've leveraged new technologies, and low cost sensors. I just want, want to give you a, um, maybe a, two minutes on, on this topic of, of, of resource allocation. Yeah, uh, it's, it's really a very difficult question to answer. Um, it's, it's really very tough to, because of the limited funds from government. They are competing sources for this funding. And what we did was that we leveraged um, funding from our partners, like UN Environment, uh, US EPA, World Bank, and all those that we work with. And at the same time, also look at what we also should generate from our, 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 our um, permitting, uh, how do you call it, uh, resource fees that we charge in terms of environmental impact assessments that we do. So there are some components within the, uh, that permitting process that you can leverage and take some money for, for monitoring education and other aspects. Though it's not enough, but you'll be able to generate something from there and then be able to also look for partner support for, to get the pro program run. Yeah. Thank you, that's helpful. So you've been incredibly resourceful. There's gotta be a better way to scale these the, these efforts, and I think we're gonna we're gonna hopefully begin um, to start thinking about that. Um, and we're gonna turn to Yuande Awe, um, who's gonna provide us with an overview of some successful interventions in targeting air pollution and climate change mitigation around the world. So, um, Yuande, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you see my presentation? Yes, you're just, um, if you put it in presentation mode, then yeah, we're Okay, go. wonderful. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, before I go on, I would just like to thank all the co-sponsors of this event um, and also everyone that is speaking today and tomorrow. And very importantly, everyone that is working behind the scenes to make sure that we can all present today and tomorrow. So um, very quickly, I'll go into my presentation. This slide here highlights why air pollution and climate change are important issues for the World Bank. At a global level, the economic burden of air pollution is very high. We have six, six point in the GBD, the global burden of disease study in 2019 estimated 6.4 million premature deaths annually. And the cost of the health damage from that, just morbidity and mortality, $8.1 trillion, equivalent to 6.1% of global GDP. And I would just like to say that the results of this study have just been published today. We have the conference edition that came out today and it's available publicly um, for everyone um, who's interested to see it. So with this very high burden, this is why we are um, very concerned about this issue. Most of the people that are affected by air pollution are usually uh, low and low, yeah, low income people. And you can see here, even by region, the disparities in the number of deaths from PM 2.5 in 2019. You can see that East Asia, South Asia, East Asia and the Pacific, South Asia carried the highest share of the burden followed by Sub-Saharan Africa. So, what are we doing as an institution in the, in the, as the World Bank? Over the past two decades, um, the bank has supported pollution projects um, through lending and technical assistance in um, the amount of over $52 billion and about $16 billion of this or 30% roughly has gone to targeting air pollution. Um, as we will hear later today from uh, the Clean Air um, Fund, um, the bank, the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank are the two largest funders uh, in terms of um, overseas development um, funding for air quality projects in recent years. Our clients have achieved tremendous results with our support. Um, this has been, the, these, these who have supported their programs, they are the ones who have achieved these results. And here you see in this table, the different uh, reductions in PM 2.5 and PM 10 that have been achieved in, in selected cities. 
what you will notice is the different time frames. That's important. So that shows the time frames go from five years to 25 years in the five years in the case of China to 25 years in the case of Mexico City. And um, you can see that it is possible um, to really achieve, to make a big dent, um, get the type of reductions that you can see here, ranging from 50% reduction to 70% reduction in a relatively short period of time. And what, what we're seeing also is that that period of time is getting shorter. Uh, um, you know, as the time has uh, has passed. So this is this is very um, important. And the achievements have been very remarkable uh, by our clients in this regard. Um, with respect to um, strengthening um, you know, the linkages between air quality management and climate change mitigation, I, I present here just an example from um, work that the bank had supported in the in China, uh, where we have uh, where we had. Uh, 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 an air pollution and prevention uh, project in the province of in, uh, Hebei. And uh, what we found in that work was that the implementation of air quality measures in Hebei um, led to 64 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent avoided, you know, from 2018 to 2020. And most of this, a lot of this was uh, contributed from transport measures, you know, through new vehicles, new fuel standards, um, house, improved household energy. And just from the installation of over a million clean stoves, um, the emission reductions that were obtained were equivalent to taking, taking off about 860,000 passenger cars from the roads each year. So pretty significant. Um, this the, here we see that um, we have different countries and uh, we see how uh, the uh, concentrations of PM uh, have reduced over time for the different uh, through different interventions through different projects that the bank has supported in different countries. What you see here is that the, again very clearly the time frame for achieving these reductions varies. You can see in the, in, the, in the blue line, you have Mexico where the bank has been working since the 80s. You see the long trend line there. Um, on the other hand, you see um, Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, which is pretty steep in a very short period of time. So um, we know that um, progress can be made in this respect and pretty fast too. Um, when there is a, a commitment um, by the government, where there is fund financing by the government, um, we know that progress can be made really fast, relatively fast, and um, policies uh, are effective. Policy reforms are instrumental, key, essential for achieving these types of reductions. What else have we learned um, from our support to our clients? We have learned that you need to do um, solid analytical work. Any kind of attempt to design or implement intervention to address air pollution and climate mitigation have to be informed by solid, thorough, rigorous um, analytical work. And this is an example from the Lima Callao area in Peru, where the bank was supporting um, the government with uh, a, a series of policy loans, we call them. And you can see the type of reductions that were achieved in, in the time frame here um, of about seven years. You see the um, topmost line with the drastic reductions there. On the right, you have the analytical work, economic analysis that was done to underpin these um, operations. And um, you can see that it's a benefit cost analysis where different interventions were um, analyzed. And of course, the, what you're looking for in this type of analysis is the interventions that um, have the highest, uh, where the benefits way exceed the costs. So you can see that in this situation, we had all the interventions had benefit high, uh, much higher than the costs. Of course, depending on the intervention, that ratio um, varied. So at the top, you have the retrofit particulate control, which had the highest benefit cost um, uh, ratio. Um, at, and it was the lowest cost intervention as well. And at the, at the other extreme, you have um, more expensive uh, intervention, but with the lower benefit cost ratio. This is critical. This needs to inform decision-making. Um, I, I can't emphasize this enough. We have also learned that um, you know, data and analytics you know, play a very significant role. What, what we know that what you do not measure, you cannot manage. 
this chart shows us very clearly the gaps, the, 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 um, the inequities in air quality monitoring, especially ground level uh, monitoring in different parts of the world. You can see there that in sub-Saharan Africa, this is the number of people um, per ground level monitoring station. And you can see that uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, this number dwarfs every other, every other region. So there is clearly a dearth of um, ground level monitors. Without the ground level monitoring information, it is, it is difficult, it is almost impossible to design um, effective um, policies, effective interventions to reduce air pollution and um, uh, by inference to mitigate um, climate uh, that may result from such efforts. So this is very important. We need to strengthen, support our uh, clients in strengthening um, data quality, data availability for informing decision making. Lastly, we find also that um, there is great power in disseminating information. I saw that there was a question in the chat about how to deal with um, vested interests. And um, really, information, information, information is key. Together with the analytical work, which you know is ever, gives you an evidence basis for what you are going to be doing and what you the types of policies the types of investments that you 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 you, you seek to design and implement um, information is key we have seen this in so many countries um, in fact this 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 slide that you see here was from, um, I don't know if I should mention the country, but anyhow, let me just tell you the, the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter was that um, the, 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 the city in question had very serious air pollution challenges. And this, there was a lot of debate. The bank had done a study about this. There was a lot of debate about it. The, the results of the study were or widely disseminated. And during the, the, uh, uh, the, the political season was going on, the campaigns were going on, and some candidates were coming to the street sides and holding up white blankets, gather, which were gathering you know, all the emissions from traffic, from other activities, all the air pollutants. And they were showing and saying, look, if you vote for me, this, your lungs will not look like this. This is what is current, you know, you cannot, if you vote for me, I will make sure that your lungs do not become this color. This is what is going into your lungs. I mean, that's a very powerful message. And you get that out there to the man on the street, to the woman on the street, making them aware that this is something that can kill you. This is something that makes your child sick and keeps your child away from school. This is something that could potentially kill you. You raise um, a public awareness of the, of, the, of the issue of air pollution, of the severity of it, um, of the deadly impact of it, and you um, strengthen social accountability um, for good air quality management. So in closing, uh, that is uh, my last slide. I would like to say thank you to everyone. Thank you so much, Yuande. That was fantastic. Um, and an incredible uh, amount of um, documented real progress on the ground. Um, a quick uh, specific question that came in from the group, um, and then I wanna lead that into a broader related one, which is um, what accounted for that dramatic reduction uh, in air pollution in Mongolia? Oh, in, in, in Mongolia, one of the key, uh, it's important to understand what the sources of pollution were. And one of them was like the um, pollution from the traditional housing settlements called the Gears, where there was lots of, um, household air pollution. And so, you know, there was a lot that the one, one big um, component of what was done was the replacement of um, um, stoves with cleaner stoves to contribute drastically to those reductions. Yes. Right. And um, so you've made this point that you've seen um, sort of accelerated um, progress as you've implemented in different parts of the world. And I wonder if you could um, talk to um, why that's happening. And, and then sort of secondly, how do you see um, opportunities sort of scaling in the future? I mean, you've, you've talked about a, you know, an $8.1 trillion cost of this pollution. And yet what I heard was $15, you know, 15 billion in investment with a, 
obviously a tremendous gap. Um, if you're seeing accelerated progress, we have this big problem, you know, what, how do we scale this? What's the envelope of, you know, total investments that we need to make to make that happen? Well, very good question. So in terms of um, why the um, progress was made very rapidly, first of all, we know what to do now, as has been mentioned before. The interventions are clear. The technical interventions are clear. What is needed is commitment. If there's government commitment, if there's adequate financing, the progress can be made. You know, those are the ingredients that we see are essential and have contributed largely. Um, in China, you know, they had a very good air quality management plan. They had set very clear goals for what, they, the, what, what, what their goals were, what their targets were that they wanted to meet. And by the end of at the, the bank's intervention, they had found that uh, they actually, in Hebei, they actually exceeded their targets. So where there's a commitment, where everybody knows that this is an agenda that is affecting all of us, our elderly, our young, all our loved ones, um, and there is a clear man mandate from, from, from government and leadership and commitment, it's, it's, it's very possible to make this um, kind of progress. To your next point, which I think preempts a little bit uh, what we will be hearing later on in the afternoon. But you're right. I mean, the, the, the funding, there is a funding gap. Most definitely there is a funding gap. And um, one of the, uh, th there's no underestimating the fact that the, one of the ways that this can be, um, I guess, uh, bridge, that gap can be bridged. First of all, we need to organize ourselves as um, people, development partners that are working together, that are concerned on this issue. We need to organize ourselves, come together, have a consensus on the severity of this problem. More public awareness, more, more, more dissemination, very key, very essential. Um, and then, you know, we in the bank for our part, I can say that we're, we know that even though you know we're, we've been listed as one of the lead funders, there's a room for a lot of improvement. And um, that is why we have, uh, for example, a new um, uh, multi-donor trust fund that uh, has just been launched, uh, the, um, has just been uh, designed the ProClean, it's called. And the idea of that will be to scale up um, investments and technical assistance and policy reforms that are addressing air quality management and climate mitigation and circular and strengthening circular economy approaches. So, yes. That's it. Well, thank you so much. I know we'll hopefully hear more about that um, in the next day or two. Um, and thank you for your contribution. And I want to thank all our speakers this morning um, for their for their contributions. Um, uh, we've clearly heard the cost of inaction is huge and that there's an enormous opportunity. Um, and we've heard that we know how to do this, right? Um, so, so now we really need to close that resource gap. And that's the session we're gonna get to next. We have a short break now. We're gonna come back together at the top of the hour, GMT, dive into this discussion. Um, we have a great lineup of individuals representing private philanthropy, multilateral and bilateral institutions. Um, working to raise the bar on, on funding. Um, so we'll see you in 10 minutes. We'll be playing some short videos for those of you who wanna um, stick around and thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>